Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining our very first webinar for the Philippine Pediatric Dental Society. We are all honored and privileged to have you all here. We are very happy because we have a very, very good, very practical, very useful first lecture for our String of Pearl series. And on behalf of all of the officers and board members of the Philippine Pediatric Dental Society, I welcome you all today. Our first lecture in our String of Pearls webinar series is a very timely one. We are all very concerned about SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19, and we have so many questions and so many things that we read but don't quite understand. So our speaker today is here to break down the figures and give us the lowdown on the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic to help us process what it is and its impact in our daily lives and profession and what is to come post-GCQ. Our speaker for today is a very well-esteemed, well-renowned speaker. He is a pediatrician and former chair of the Department of Pediatrics at the Asian Hospital with subspecialty in infectious diseases and clinical pharmacology. He was also a director at the Food and Drug Administration, and he is a top resource person for COVID-19, for which he writes daily on this for ANC. He is currently the chairman of the Infectious Disease Department at the UST Hospital. Let us all welcome our esteemed speaker for today, Dr. Benjamin Ko. Dr. Ko, Dr. Benji, can we have you? Yeah, good, af good afternoon, everyone. Yes. Good afternoon, Dr. Benji. Thank you so much for gracing us and helping us today with our webinar series. I will give the floor up to you, sir. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, let me see how I figure this out. Am I on? Yes, Dr. Benji, your, your audio and yeah. video are, are good. Okay. So do I start the, your, your talk? <laughs> the talk? Yes, go ahead, Dr. Benji. Right. We will give you as much time as we can because I'm sure we will also have a lot of questions later on. All right. I, let, let's not, I, I hope I don't talk too much. All right. Um, I think my presentation this afternoon so we don't don't all get distracted i'll turn my video off um or are on is on this topic on um, numbers and matters that matter this was given by peachy uh she selected this topic and um it's actually on what to know as we adapt to the new normal i don't know if i will give you adequate information but let me try to do that um what we will be talking about today are all these four points, uh, the current status of COVID-19 globally and its presentation in the pediatric population in the Philippines. I did not bother to go through the global data anymore because um, it will not be relevant to our local setting anyway. Medications and other drug regimens currently used for COVID-19 management. Of course, we want to talk about the vaccine because everybody is excited to find out if we are going to have one or is it something that will take quite some time before we're going to even get it. And of course, the restrictions, its impact on the number of cases we should be expecting in the coming months. So my disclosure is I don't have a crystal ball. So, and unfortunately, because I don't have one, I can only give you data today I cannot predict the future. And I wish I could. Uh, unfortunately, with a pandemic like this, I don't think this is going... The, the bad news is I don't think this is something that is going to subside anytime soon. So that's the bad news. And the worst news is if you look at where we are in the world today, and I'm sure you can all access the slides, 
it does not look like we are going anywhere uh, on a downtrend soon. If you notice the first quarter, which ended sometime in March, um, we were already on a steep slope. And that steep slope started all the way in January. Actually, the, the steep slope started somewhere in March, but we had cases already sometime in January. And if you look at the total number of cases, we were all on curse at China at the beginning of this pandemic, which means that we were just sitting back and counting the numbers China had, only to find out that we would escalate into this uh problem a couple of months after china so china today has 90,000 cases the world has almost 10 million and we should be reaching the 10 million mark if i am not mistaken based on my prediction and my data on or before the end of the month unfortunately and this is data as of today we have had 171,000 cases overnight. So if you look at the past week, the past 10 days alone, we've been breaching 150,000 cases for the past 10 days. And if you breach 150,000 cases daily for the past 10 days, you reach 1 million much faster. As a matter of fact, you arrive at that in less than a week. So if, you, if this becomes a multiplier effect, then weekly we will have 1 million each, 1 million cases each. Now, on the reported deaths, there is a rapid decline on the number of deaths. So that part is the good news, which means that unfortunately, over the last 10 days also, the seven-day average has been around 5,000 deaths globally which means that we are looking at the end point of China, which is around 5% case fatality rate before they lifted the lockdown in Wuhan. Where are the new cases increasing? Well, of course, we've, we're excited no? because we see some countries like New Zealand doing much better, but they have more ships than people in that place. So unless we count the coronaviruses among the sheep, um, it would not be fair to compare apples and oranges. We are a very dense country, and uh, our density is different from theirs. They have, per square kilometer, 900 people. We have 20,000 people per square kilometer. And the density of a country is also a big contributor to the total number of cases. So while ca some countries are doing better, most have actually seen the return of the viral infection when government began to lock restrictions. And that's the unfortunate part. I know that we are used to a more lax environment. We love to travel. We love to go out. We love to shop. And the 21st century especially with technology at our fingertips, has allowed us to get things quicker. Unfortunately, this is where we are today. So we belong to one of those countries that are still seeing a rise in the total number of cases. As a matter of fact, this is where we were a few months ago and then where we were towards the middle of the second quarter. So the middle of the first half of the second quarter that was from March all the way until the end of April. This was us. And um, towards the end of April till the end of June, this is where we are today, still on the rise. Not really very nice news, diba. Right? And this is the data as of yesterday. And we're seeing that particular trend. We had 774 new cases. And the only good news I can give you is that our case fatality rate is really low. Global case fatality rate is approximately 5%. So 
our case fatality rate in the country is 3.73. And while we pat our box at a lower case fatality rate, we should not do that because there are some Southeast Asian countries that are actually doing better than us. Singapore, for example, may have more cases, but their case fatality rate is less than 0.5%. They have less than 50 deaths in all their 40 plus thousand cases. Vietnam has zero death. Cambodia has also zero death. So Malaysia has less than 1.5% deaths. The only other Southeast Asian nation that has more deaths than us is our neighbor, Indonesia. Um, in terms of recovery rate, we're also lousy at that. That's because the local government units um, wait for two negative swabs after a positive swab. Even though the patient has already passed the 30-day period of um, recovery. Um, there is a new criteria, which the WHO and Singapore, Japan, United States, the UK, and other better parts of the world have already said that after 14 days, if a patient, even if he is positive, is asymptomatic or has not had fever for three straight days, and then you add 14 more days, um, into the recovery period, you do not need to retest. And I will explain that to you at the end of the slide on why retests are not done. But uh, the local government units are a kingdom of their own. Today, we've had over 600,000 tests, but we've had more tests than only in the past month. Something that they should have done in the very beginning, something that Senator Binay and Senator Marcos chided the DOH over na dapat nung simula pa, marami ng tests ang in order. But unfortunately, uh, like um, many things that we do, we, we beg for donations. So we were dependent on donations at the start. And sadly, that is why we are where we are today. And this is the data I was showing you a while ago. The, this data that I showed you a while ago, that one, this one is from the New York Times. So this is where we are. This is based on Worldometer. Um, and we've had more cases over the last week. We've had the highest case the other, the other day. Most of them... And I, the government defines it as fresh and late. I do not know why they even bother to do that. I know that they tried to do that in the very beginning because they wanted to differentiate uh, the newer cases from the backlogs. And I think pabibo yan eh. Now they were hoping that over the next few days, yung backlog pa konti ng pa konti. Eh, hindi naman kaya ng gobyerno natin. Padami ng padami yung backlog kasi padami din ng padami yung test. So since padami din ng padami yung test, hindi naman nila ma-validate ko konti yung tao. Hindi naman padami din ng padami yung mga nagba-validate. So we're in that rut. Ay. So this is where we are today and we're going to get more backlogs if you look at the fresh and the late because we have not capacitated the manpower. That's a sad state. This is the four o'clock story of the DOH. I think they already have, if I'm not mistaken, they may already have um, data. I'm not too sure if it's on the site. Ah, uh, Yeah, they have already. 1,006 cases today. Very good. 266 fresh from the NCR, 113 late from the NCR. So the National Capital Region holds in 379 cases, while Region 7 holds in 251 fresh today and seven uh, late today. The others, the others, you see there's always others. The, and if you follow my blog, na pepeste ako dyan sa others na yan. There are actually more others 
that are fresh cases and then there are 98 late cases among others. The others are the ones that are not within the NCR and Region 7. And I've always commented that the four o'clock habit of the Department of Health should be thrown away because it may, it, it, it's kind of dumb, dumb that um, you report a summary today and then you wait until tomorrow so that we can break it down. They don't know where these people are coming from. Tomorrow you will see there is a 10 o'clock habit also. That's the one that we dissect the following day again so that we can find out which particular cities in the NCR, which provinces in Region 7, so on and so forth, are actually the leaders. In yesterday's case, which is part of my blog tonight, which I have not yet posted, uh, sadly, the NCR leads, but of the um, 400 cases we've had last night, almost 200 of them, we don't know where they're coming from. So, ganun na naman yung story ni NCR. It is always NCR. It is always the National Capital Region that have the unknowns. So, I don't know how they reconcile it even later on. We had 12 deaths today. And that means it brings down our uh, mortality rate further uh, because we have very few deaths. And we expect more numbers of cases to go up until we reach a certain point wherein we cannot detect any more cases because of the increased number of patients that we are testing. Supposedly, we've had more severe. Uh, these are the total number of active cases on the right side. Um, there are actually more severe cases. This started at 60 plus two days ago. So this is up at 117, and I think the numbers here are actually reflective of the data in Cebu. Even the deaths yesterday, the, the deaths yesterday were mostly in Cebu. Only two deaths were accounted for by the National Capital Region. The remaining were all in Cebu or in Region 7. Now, and this is where you see the discrepancy where the government says that these are hospital beds and MEC beds for COVID-19 and at ask them to correct it because if this is not for COVID-19, then this data here and this slide here don't match. Kasi sa kanila, 24 lang yung critical. And yet, the total number of ventilators in use is almost 20%. And 20% of almost 2,000 is 400 ventilators. So the severe and the critical, even though you add it up together, will not make up 400 people. And that, that, that's a large, large discrepancy. They, the government has a lot of temporary treatment and monitoring facilities, which I have always called the white elephant. Because as a general rule, you don't lock down the barangays. Um, we know that most of these cases that are circulating now are actually in the urban poor. You pick them up and then you put them in these um, COVID facilities so that you can quarantine them. You can isolate them actually, sorry. You isolate the sick people. So you isolate them. And when you isolate them, everybody that you that he comes in contact with, you contact trace. If they're positive, then isolate them again. But you must remove them from the community. Otherwise, these numbers will never end. If you look at the cases by age group and by sex, um, most of the cases are actually between 20 and 59 years old. Ito yung mga pasaway talaga. Yung kailangan magtrabaho, tayo yun. No? You, you go to the supermarket, go to the butika, do the lala move, you do the, the grab, etc., etc. So ito yun. Ito yung bulk. But we have a large pediatric population. About 7% are pediatric patients. With most of them belonging to the 10 to 19 years old group compared to the 9 years old and below. And then of course there are the senior citizens. Um, more males get affected than females. In terms of recovery rate by age group, um, the, these are percentages based on the number of recovered cases. And like I said, because the, we have a very poor way of, um, con we have a poor way of 
reporting recoveries. You will see that in certain areas. Because if you look at our recovery rate, ang baba eh. Ang baba. The world recovery rate is almost 55%. That's the global recovery. Even the Asian, the ASEAN data, the ASEAN data shows that the recovery rate is around 55%. But the Philippine recovery rate is very low. It's not because the patients don't recover. It's because we have a lot of recoveries, but I don't know why they cannot even report the recoveries. And if you don't report the recoveries, uh, then it does not get reported. But between recoveries and deaths, the most important parameter is death. Kasi yung recovery, pwede siyang nawala na. Dami yan, actually, 90 days nang magaling, pero hanggang ngayon hindi pa recovered. Kasi nawala na eh. Lalo na yung mga sa barangay, yung mga sa urban poor. Pag nalaman niya na meron siya, tatakas yan, mawawala yan. Wala na kayong mahahanap. At hindi niya na yan marirecover. Kaya ang taas-taas ng ating unknown. Unknown talaga. That's why, the, to me, if you ask me, I would prefer that these people are always put in a facility so that you can track them down and um, you are able to register whether they have actually recovered or not. And you decrease the transmission as well. So the mortality rate is highest in 60 and above. But when you go to SNR early in the morning, you see the 60-year-olds, they're there. They're queuing already. If you look at the malls, sila din yung laman ng mall. Um, but uh, there's nothing we can do because sometimes out of necessity, uh, the senior citizens will really have to go out on their own because nobody else will buy food for them. Okay, so I finished the demographics. Now let's talk about treatment or prevention. Um, are vaccines better than drug therapy? And I think that's an important thing that we need to consider, uh, whether vaccines are actually better than drug therapy. Um, to me, and, and this is personal, to me, the way to go would actually be uh, treatment rather than a vaccine. And the reason for my saying that the way to go is to look for a treatment rather than a vaccine is because it's so difficult to live with a patient who is sick. Because once you are sick, you would want a treatment readily available. Now, the vaccines do not assure, not even the conventional vaccines that we have, 100% efficacy. So... There are many platforms in the drug vaccine development, and these are actually the finalists for vaccines with the US FDA. They call it Operation Warp Speed. There's one by AstraZeneca and Oxford, which is in the phase two, phase three clinical trial. Um, Johnson & Johnson, one from Rome. Uh, this is from Italy. It's by Raitera. And the other one is from China, which is CanSino. These four are running on an adenovirus platform, which means the adenovirus vector is the one responsible for the immunologic response of the COVID or the SARS-CoV-2 um, virus. The problem with these platforms for adenovirus is that, like for example, in the CanSino study, the phase one uh, data is underwhelming because of the issue of pre-existing antibodies. So if you have already antibodies for adenovirus, it can decrease the efficacy of the vaccine. And that's what they're seeing, that most of the patients on these different platforms, the efficacy is really not that good. At best, you go to 40, 50% so far. And you may need multiple doses of the vaccine. And that's what makes vaccine trials difficult. Because after getting a dose, you will have to wait for how many of, for a, a couple of months to find out how many of the patients develop antibodies eventually. And how much antibodies you develop, how much immunity you develop, how much neutralizing antibodies you develop against that particular virus uh, given to you passively. So that becomes a, a challenge, actually. 
Um, and these are the four that have an adenovirus vaccine platform. On the other hand, um, there are some that run on a nucleotide platform. And these are the ones out of, ito yung mRNA. Yan. Yan. Kita nyo yung DNA, mRNA, para naintindihan ninyo. Ito yung property nila. Ito ang kanilang platform. So this is a nucleotide-based platform. And they, the nucleotide-based platform compared to the adenovirus platforms are encountering actually almost the same problems in terms of efficacy. As a matter of fact, mas maganda pa nga yung platform ng adenovirus kesa sa um, nucleotide platform. But we'll see what happens in the next few phases of the clinical trials because not a lot of the clinical trials go through rich phase three. As a matter of fact, while the world tells you that, and you get that news, that they tell you that there are 100 plus vaccines that are now in development, 75 of those are in paper. These are the only ones that are actually in the different phases of development. Okay, so the president is wrong that there is already a vaccine that is available. Um, and there are different platforms for use, like those that are inactivated and itong mga prob protein subunit um, vaccines are actually the ones that um, are being developed as well. Uh, mas mahirap itong mga inactivated virus vaccines. So while the clinical trials for COVID-19 show encouraging data, neither the nucleotide-based or the adenovirus-based approaches have ever produced a vaccine that has been approved in the U.S. or the EU before. If you look at all of, if, if you have children, if you look at all of the vaccines that we have, because I'm a pediatrician, no? That, that are available, they're either live, live attenuated, or recombinant. Wala pa kami na nabibigay na nucleotide or adenovirus base. That means we require a vector. Um, and this has never been done in the world before. It, it, it's secondary to all of these, actually. Uh, it, it's secondary to the, the current problem. That's why we're seeing a lot of um, innovations in molecular biology. So the earlier attempts with adenovirus vaccines were at least disappointments. And some of the recipients, I already told you that, if you have pre-existing immunity to the adenovirus vector, um, the immune response to that particular vaccine is actually low. Okay, so these two, there we call them platforms. These two platforms have theoretical advantage when it comes to manufacturing, while the established platforms, the ones that are being developed by the good old Sanofi, Glaxo, kasi itong mga bagong platforms na to, ang mga nagde-develop nito, yung mga hindi natin kilala, Moderna, Oxford, they combine with AstraZeneca. Yung iba, ginagamit namin, Usually, it's the protein subunit that's the killed and inactivated na, na platform. Mas matagal ito, yung, kwan, yung mga killed and inactivated, because you have to find an adjuvant that will trigger a strong immune response. Okay, so I hope you understood what I am talking about. Uh, Let's talk about drugs now. As of May 2020, some of them have used adaptive trial designs. So I'm sure you've heard about the Solidarity Trial, which is organized by the WHO. And one of the drugs that has been in, in focus is Remdesivir. This is out of Gilead uh, in the United States. Remdesivir is not a new drug. It is an old drug. As a matter of fact, it's a beautiful drug in the treatment of Ebola. Um, the pharmaceutical company did not market remdesivir widely because Ebola was, did not become a global problem. And you know how pharmaceutical companies are. Unless there is a global need for it, 
then they are not going to uh, manufacture it in bulk. So this is the only one with a promise. It actually shows in the various clinical trials a decrease in the duration of illness among patients severely ill. So it works at decreasing the duration of illness. But in patients that are very ill, that means that they, they're critical, they already have complications, the mortality is the same. Whether your patients are on remdesivir or not. So, so far the studies show that it contributes to the decrease in the duration of illness, but in the severity of illness, uh, the outcomes are the same. So it is given together with antiretroviral drugs, drugs that are used in the treatment of HIV. Chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine has been withdrawn because we've seen that there have been a lot of complications cardiovascular-wise but we still give it together in combination with interferon beta. The recovery trial, which is the largest trial in the UK, uh, and the trial, biggest trial actually of drugs to treat COVID-19, use, uses again lopinavir, lopinavir plus ritonavir. It used hydroxychloroquine, but it eventually withdrew it. But this is where you see the dexamethasone being used together with it. And in patients that will require oxygen therapy or intubation, the administration of dexamethasone together with remdesivir, lopinavir, ritonavir, interferon beta, with or without azithromycin and with or without the monoclonal antibody tocilizumab, um, actually improves the outcome of these patients. So we now know that there are drugs that actually improve the outcome. And that is the reason why uh, the death rate, the mortality rate is actually much lower globally. Because if you look at the, the initial mortality rate, the initial mortality rates in various countries were more than 12 to 15 percent. So there are other studies which include the breathing support, recovery respiratory support study, which prevents people from needing to go on a ventilator either by putting them on CPAP or high flow nasal oxygen. Um, and the, there are encouraging results for patients that are being put either on CPAP or HFNO. Uh, the mortality rate for patients that get intubated is almost 80%. There is the HERO study from Canada that finds out whether hydroxychloroquine before and during exposure to patients reduces the risk of COVID-19 and it is, still, um, it is still ongoing in spite of the fact that the WHO has actually withdrawn it. Uh, The COVA study in Spain um, evaluates actually healthcare workers of wearing PPEs to investigate whether their working conditions can be improved. And there is an international cover study which collects information regarding artery and vein or vascular conditions um, as part of medical care for patients. There is a UCOS study which looks at the pandemic in pregnancy there is the sleep COVID-19 study, which tests early online treatment in the form of sleep education. And there is the COVID-19 POC study. Uh, this is a new rapid test for COVID-19, which can lead to earlier decision-making and better care for patients. And it's still ongoing, and the test for this is still being evaluated. So between 100 years of the first pandemic for flu, and the coronavirus pandemic, we are actually in a better position because we have more of technology, we have more of science, we have more knowledge at our fingertips. Yet, it's half the year, there are 10 million cases, and the virus has taken almost half a million lives. If we still trend this way, 
we will not be any different from the 1918 flu pandemic, which took 2 million lives in two years. Next, the policy responses to the coronavirus pandemic is actually obtained from the Oxford Coronavirus Government Response Tracker, and you can always download that. Um, these are what we do in order to minimize the transmissibility of the virus. So I'll show you a couple of slides and what the governments all over the world have done. For example, if you look at the dark, I don't know what color this is, um, the dark fuchsia, is it fuchsia? Uh, compared to the green, then compared to uh, the mustard, I hope I'm not colorblind, um, you'll see that there are countries that actually require the closure of schools during the pandemic, the Philippines included. Um, in Japan, they only required at some levels. In Australia, um, there are no measures taken, and in New Zealand. Well, they don't see a lot of cases anymore. If you look at cancellation of public events, uh, globally, a lot require the cancellation, including the Philippines. If you look at restrictions on public gatherings, um, there are different levels of restriction. Restrictions are based on the size of the public gathering. And the darker the blue, col the, the darker blue color tells you that we restrict it to less than 10 people, which includes the Philippines, and the IATF has issued a new memorandum to include that part of the restriction in a cemetery, if you are going to go, should not be more than 10 people. So, sampung tao lang ang pwedeng makipaglibing. Okay? Um, on public information campaigns, you will see that all, all over the world, um, we coordinate information campaigns. I don't know if we can call ours coordinated, but yeah, I guess we can with the IATF and the NTF um, doing the campaigns for us. Uh, the, there are only some countries where in public officials urge caution, but globally, there is a, a move to uh, have more coordinated campaigns. With regards to stay-at-home requirements, it's required, and there are a few exceptions in most countries. Uh, in other countries, it is required, and except for essential, and we fall under that, the, the required with few exceptions. For public transport closures during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we recommend closing in order to reduce the volume but we are not as strict as required closing and prohibits most of us using it. In China, they, when they lock down, they actually lock down completely. There was no movement at all. Ours is a lockdown, but they gave the key to us. You lock and then give the key. Sa kanila, they lock and then they took the key away. So they, they had to bring food to each of the households. I don't think our local government units will even do that for us because they don't have the people and the manpower. On restrictions on internal movement, we recommend movement restriction, but we do not have restrictions as difficult as Russia and China and as other parts of the world. On international travel controls, uh, we have total border closure, but we've opened it um, to some degree, particularly for overseas foreign workers. Uh, on COVID-19 testing policies, there are it's divided into four categories. Either there's no testing or you only test for symptoms, those patients with symptoms, or you can test anyone with symptoms which are in green. And of course, there is the open public testing which includes asymptomatics. Korea um, and uh, China and all of the other countries, the United States, Canada, for example, uh, 
uh, have the open public testing, including the asymptomatic. South America, which includes Brazil, anyone with symptoms, but you see the numbers in Brazil, my God, they are running after the United States. Today, the U.S. and Brazil reported 40,000 cases each. That's the reason why I'm saying we will close the gap sooner than later to 10 million. Um, the Philippines, anyone with symptoms, uh, we do not do open public testing. Which countries do COVID-19 contact tracing? Well, uh, we have limited tracing. Okay? We, the problem with our contact tracing is that we do not have enough people to do it for us. But we should, and we should do first-tier contact tracing. So if somebody is positive, at least do the first-tier contacts. But there are countries like South Korea, for example, that do very comprehensive tracing in all cases, and Singapore. Income support, we have had some income support. Ito yung tinatawag ng gobyerno na ayuda, ayuda. So we cover less than 50% of lost salary. But other countries that are wealthier in Europe and in the U.S. cover more than 50% of the lost salaries. For debt, or contract relief, there is none in the country. Okay? But other countries provide um, a broad relief or a narrow relief, like in the US, China, they have narrow relief. Australia provided a broad relief, but you will see those countries that provide narrow and broader reliefs to be the more uh, affluent ones. If you look at Southeast Asia, which includes Indonesia, Tayo, Malaysia, and so on and so forth, um, no relief is actually provided. The Government Response Stringency Index, you see as the color darkens to darker blue, the stringency is greater, while those that are in lighter shades have less um, stringent composite measures based on the nine response indicators I mentioned a while ago, so the school closure, work closure, travel ban, etc., etc. And if you look at Google mobility trends, how has the pandemic changed the movement of people in the Philippines? This is how it has. It, we, we had the lockdown in March. In February, we were still moving. Kahit na may kaso na, dun sa tatlong inchik na dumating, three Chinese, one died. Uh, we were not afraid. We, we kept moving and moving. There are a lot of people that were still flying out and flying in. Kasi sayang yung miles. Um, but eventually, after the lockdown, you will see that the majority of the Filipinos stayed at home. Even up to now, where we are already in GCQ, a lot of people would still prefer to stay at home. And I'm sure patients call you, they call me, is it safe? to go to the hospital. And I always retort, do you go to the supermarket? They say, yes. Oh, the supermarket is dirtier than the hospital. The hospital is the most aseptic, is the most aseptic place. We clean it day in and day out. That's the reason why we do that is because we try to minimize infections. They don't do that in the supermarkets or in the public market. And if you look at the movement in the workplace, people prefer now to work from home. They like it in the confines of their home. So a lot of people don't like to go back to work. So I do webinars also for uh, how to get back to workplaces because a lot of the, um, the workforce are comfortable working from their laptops at home. But that cannot be because we, we need to do face-to-face associations with patients, with customers. We, we cannot be working at the confines of our homes. The groceries and the pharmacies have come back. They shut down for a while. Parks are still no-nos. The transit stations and retail and recreation are still all the way down, although there has been some semblance. But this has destroyed actually a lot of businesses. And I'm sure you will agree with me that 50% of the business says have closed. Uh, in our area alone, um, a lot of the uh, restaurants um, 
can barely survive that even some of the restaurants have already asked that people stop using those that have PWDs and senior citizen discounts to please stop using them for a while. So if you look at retail and recreation, this is how the number of visitors changed since the beginning of the pandemic. And if you concentrate on us, walaya. Diba? Nandito tayo. The darker the shade, then the less the visitors and the less the retail and recreation. Grocery and pharmacy stores, we belong to this darker shade as well. Transit station, we belong to this darker shade as well. Parks and outdoor spaces, we belong to the darker shade as well. Nobody's allowed to go out. Residential areas, we're all confined. Most of us stay within our homes. Of course, there are those that would prefer to go out. Um, but we're still within the 10 to 20 percent. Uh, how did the time spent at home change since the beginning of the pandemic? We've had more time at home with our families. Lastly, is the problem with the current community quarantine is that it is not based on good data. So people were asking, is the ECQ, GCQ, MECQ, MGCQ, are these going to help, and so on and so forth, or whatever, barbecue, QQQ at the end. Uh, if you don't have a plan, nothing is going to help. Because I've always said that. I'm not anti-government. I'm just after the data, which means that you can only base a good policy on the data that is provided to you. Bad data results in bad policies. How can you make a good policy if you have bad data? How can you make good policies when all of your data are late? The impact is on the community. And bad policies result in a domino effect. Poor judgment, economic suffering, anxiety, depression in general. And we have nobody else to blame except the rise of the morons. So we go into testing, testing, one, two, three. Are we all on the same page? Because a lot of people always ask, what is the better test? And I've always told people that, these antibodies, antibodies are useless. Why? And this is what I was explaining to you in the beginning. You see, with PCR being utilized here, they're most likely positive in the first three weeks. Thereafter, thereafter, even if you do PCR and these patients test positive, they are most likely skeletal remnants of SARS-CoV-2. Because PCR will not be able to determine whether they are live viruses or they are the skeletal remnants. So in the first few weeks of your illness, especially if you have symptoms, most likely live yet, kasi symptomatic guy. But when you're already asymptomatic, then the PCR is not very useful. And that's the reason why the WHO has also recommended, not only the WHO, but better governments and health agencies in the world has, have decided that uh, it's a waste of money to keep continuing doing a PCR test. You know, you know, I have a patient that has tested positive for a PCR even six times. 90 days na siya, positive pa din siya. Um, and that's possible. Uh, it was only on the seventh time that he tested negative and he refused to do it anymore because it's painful to have that thing shoved into your nose. It's not just into your nose. It has to be shoved all the way down to the nasopharyngeal area. The antibodies, on the other hand, are useful only after the 10th day. So if you are sick, you might test negative in the first few days. So it's going to be useless to test sick people. And then if you're going to test them, you will get false negatives. For example, if you, you have an asymptomatic patient or you have a patient that came in contact with somebody who is PCR positive and you just do the RAT, I call it RAT, rapid antibody test, and he turns out negative, he will turn out negative talaga in the first few days. So you will have a false sense of security 
only to find out that this patient is actually going to spread the infection. So in summary, if you do the PCR, it deteriorates in sensitivity after the third week. The total antibodies are actually good. But the problem with doing total antibody tests is we don't know what level is protective. We just know that probably it will be useful because you have antibodies. The, the, the problem is hindi namin alam kung ano talaga yung cut-off para masabi mo, ah, okay, protected ka. Is it 100? Is it 1,000? And then, of course, the IgM and the IgG. I, I explained the rat a while ago. It's useful uh, only for um, doing epidemiological studies. So the British Medical Journal um, published this the other day. And this is a recent publication regarding the concern on the antibody testing. And there are three concerns about this. First, there's no specific clinical indication for the test. Second is the performance of these assays have not been assessed to the standard typically required of a new test. And third, the resource implications are not considered. So if you're going to use it for um, epidemiologic purposes later on and studying it only, then that's fine. But uh, unfortunately, the foundation for delivering the right result of the right test to the right person at the right time um, is not prioritized in a rapid antibody test. So one, there's no clinical indication. Um, you have to make sure that antibody testing fulfills several purposes. And therefore, we have problems when we do a rapid antibody test as a screening procedure for patients who just need to go back to work. They improve performance because we don't know the true positives from the true negatives. Remember, these tests are not exactly for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, they are for coronavirus, and we know that coronavirus is the most one of the most common causes of the common cold. So it really probably will not give you a lot of data when you turn out positive for IgG later on. And of course, the wasted resources um, because uh, somebody pushed this as a political event. Everybody now wants to join the bandwagon of selling, testing, using rapid antibodies. And like I said, it will give you a false sense of security. And this was the data yesterday. I heard somebody from the task force saying that we're doing 50,000 tests, 30,000 already to 50,000. That's a lie. And I will say that straight in the face. Because if this is the data in the Philippines, you will see that over the last few days, we have not even tipped the 15,000. Maka ibig niyan sabihin 15, hindi 50, hindi type 0. So, sana naman hindi sila nang gogoyo ng mga tao with misinformation and disinformation. And I say that publicly because... Um, Two people cannot be telling the truth. You know, you say 50, but the DOH tells you this is all we have. So what's the real score? But we are doing more tests. That's the good part. Uh, of those test samples yesterday, this positivity rate of 6.9% is the cumulative average, which I have always told the DOH. Na, I think it is best that we show the daily average rather than the cumulative. Because the cumulative will just show you over the time that we started doing all the tests. You see, dumami yung tests na over the, since March, dumami na yung tests natin. Over the time that we've been doing the test, um, mababa pa din ang ating positive rate, which is really true kasi 10% yung cut off eh, to say we're testing enough. But, it will vary from day to day. And so it's important that we try to find out what the daily rate is. And yesterday was 7.1%. Okay. 
that's the last slide. And I, if you have any questions, that's it. Thank you very much, Dr. Benji. You know, this is a very, very timely topic. That's why we wanted you to be our first speaker for this webinar series. We have a lot of questions and a lot of us really, you know, listen and read about all the data that's out there, but it's really quite difficult to understand all of it. So thank you. You were very enlightening. And with the, the DOH studies also and the data that they gave us, it's also very, very difficult to understand sometimes. So we do have a lot of questions from the floor, if you are ready to answer them, sir. Yeah, I have a few minutes for everyone. Sure. All right. So our first question, you mentioned um, the medication remdesivir. Um, is remdesivir available here in the Philippines and is it currently being used for our COVID-19 patients yes, now? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's available but on a compassionate special permit, which means that uh, it has to be uh, requested by the hospital way ahead. And it is part of the regimen for the solidarity trial. All right, that's that's good to know. At least uh, we have that medication on hand. Um, there's a next question, sir. What can you say about herd immunity? I know it's a very uh, controversial topic for some. Is it possible to have herd immunity, especially here in the Philippines? Yeah, it's possible. And it's possible that herd immunity may be ongoing in certain areas. And like I said, uh, it's not really that the virus has become milder. Uh, some of the, but there's an Italian doctor that was mentioning that it may have become milder. Uh, if you look at those certain areas, um, there are not a lot of fatality rates because one of the things that you want you may want to consider is that some of the younger population may be getting the infection and uh, herd immunity actually may be playing a role. And I, I look, I go to the word maybe. But you must also consider the fact that uh, of all these patients that have had um, COVID-19, the recent data shows that uh, the immunity does not last long. That's why I'm worried about the convalescent plasma because they've shown that antibodies decline very rapidly, which means that patients who may have had this in March don't have antibodies anymore by June. Uh -oh. And so that's the difficulty in developing a vaccine as well. So, sandali lang siya. And when that happens, the patients can get, patients who have had COVID can get COVID again. Oh, okay. That is a little disheartening to hear, Dr. Yeah, Benji. That's the recent to, study. Oh, my. So, all this time, at least for me personally, I thought that, you know, once you have the antibodies that no. you would be oh no no that's quite that's disheartening why you have to, to live a new normal true true sir Again, true but that, until, that is something important until until a vaccine is developed so that's why it's a toss up between treating at, at this point when you ask the question i would have preferred that we have a treatment rather than a vaccine Every, at least yeah. every time I'm sick, I will take it, diba? I mean, it's yeah. the same thing with flu. Even though you've had flu, next year you can still come down with flu. That's the reason why we get the shots, but the shots are annual, right? Because the strains yeah. change every year. So it's the same. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's, it has almost a similar pattern. Okay, that's that's very disheartening, although it is very important to know. Like you said, there are people who have had antibodies present in March, and then by June, there's none. So they can still be infected. Yeah, that's the yeah, sad we part. Need to, we need to keep that in mind. That's very, very important. I think if, if we take out take away anything from today, that's that's one of the big things. Our next question, Dr. Benji. 
Um, is it true that there is permanent lung damage after being infected with SARS-CoV-2 and that there is no such thing as a full recovery like you mentioned? Um, how about the asymptomatic? Oh, yes, sir. Yeah, well, one, one at a time, no? Um, for patients who actually have permanent lung damage are usually those who already have lung damage from the get-go. That means, ito yung mga may emphysema, ito yung mga may COPD, ito, yung mga, ito na yung... yung the, this, these are the populations that will probably have a permanent lung damage. And you have to remember, oxygen will always damage your lung. I mean, even in children, no? You see the preemies, mm -hmm. they, they're put on oxygen, they, they develop restrictive lung diseases. So uh, you see that also in adults who may have had problems already from the get -go. So may underlying pulmonary pathology ka na. And patients who have underlying pulmonary problems, once intubated or there is, or you stay on an oxygen supplement for quite some time, that's the reason why... Um, the studies on either using CPAP or nasal flow uh, are ongoing is so that we try to avoid having to intubate patients. Otherwise, intubating them will um, result in more lung damage. And the mortality actually for patients who are intubated is very high. The ones that really make that recover from them are those that without pre-existing conditions those without pre-existing pulmonary diseases. Yung mga naninigarilyo, tigilan nyo na, this is the best time to stop smoking because or vaping because I will guarantee you when you come down with COVID, you're dead. I, I will give you that guarantee because you already have um, some extent of lung damage from the get-go. Yes, that's to all of the smokers out there, vapors out there, you heard Dr. Benji. This is the best time to quit. Yeah. Besides, if you're in quarantine, you might not have, you know, your supplies anyway. So, sir, a uh, quick follow-up to that last question. How about the asymptomatic carriers? Will they suffer from lung damage as well? They're asymptomatic. So that means they're, from the term asymptomatic, they have no symptoms. That, that, that's the... That, that's the thing with asymptomatics. Eh? You see, you get patients that, that, that's why we call them asymptomatic. No symptoms at all. And when you test them and they test positive and you retest them in 48 hours, sometimes some of them will already test negative. Why? Why 48? Why are they negative already in 48? Mm -hmm. Because they may, at the time that you discovered them, they may have been at the tail end of the disease. Or, or the infection, for that matter, not disease, sorry, of the infection, for that matter. So that's what they do. That's the protocol, actually, at Asian. I was talking to the IPC. Um, for the healthcare workers, what they do is, if they're asymptomatic, they test them. So they have exposure. So they test mm -hmm. them, like positive sila. Asymptomatic sila. In 48 to 72 hours, nag retest sila. Kasi marami sa kanila, pag retest mo, negative na. Kesa sa hindi mo pinapapasok ng 14 days ng quarantine. Kasi wala tayong tao na. You waste resources. Eh. Okay. okay. So if the patients don't have symptoms, they don't have symptoms, you can retest them earlier. If you just want to make sure. Otherwise, if you don't want to spend any more, what you can do, if you don't want to spend, it's just 14 days quarantine. That's it. True, true. <laughs> if they don't show any symptoms, then yeah, they must nothing. be in the clear. Yeah. Yes. All right. Nothing happens okay, to you in 14 days, nothing will happen to you. That one is good to hear. That, yeah. that one is good to hear, Dr. Benji. Yes. Moving on to our next question from, the, from our participants. Um, could you kindly explain the effect of COVID-19 to children? Why do they have a low mortal mortality rate compared to other age groups? Um, I'm not pretty sure, but I, the, our hypothesis rests actually on the immunologic uh, responses of the body. You know how children are. No? They, they're, when it comes to immunologic responses, they're 
they're very resilient compared to adults. Um, yeah. That's the reason why even if you give them several immunizations all at the same time and one month apart, nothing happens to them. They, they, they recover very quickly. And uh, their, the immune memory is, is very brisk in the pediatric population, uh, especially those that are um, below 10 years old, below 12 years old. The 10 to 19, the, the, the teenagers, on the other hand, are more immunocompromised. Akala lang nila magkwan sila malakas. Yan ang problema sa teenagers. Kasi they think they're Superman. They're, they're at that age when their hormones are raging. But it is the same hormones that bring down your immunologic response. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's the reason why I have many patients who are teenagers. Sila yung may PTB. Diba? Sila yung may pulmonary tuberculosis, may lung disease. Yeah. Yan, yung age group. It's all those hormones. Well, because the, uh, the, the hormones that you have that, that, play, that play a part of your immune response in the body are highest at that, that age group as well. So mm -hmm. they think, you know, that the hormones are double-bladed. You have to remember, when you, you give patients artificially testosterone or estrogen, uh, the libido is increased, right? Mm -hmm. the, the libido mm -hmm. is all the way up. Because artificially, these are what these hormones do. Unfortunately, uh, the other blade, the other part of the blade will bring down your immune res your your immunologic responses so you, your immune system is compromised with all of these so you cannot have very high levels of these uh, when you when you do uh, this is when during the teenage years and i see the the teenagers at this point with the teenage years most of these children um, have more problems when, when it comes to uh, getting infections and recovering from them. Mm -hmm. Oh, that, that's very good to know, sir. Um, there, are, there was a report also that even though children do have a lower mortality rate and they are mostly asymptomatic, when they do show symptoms of uh, the disease, it's actually very severe already. So they go from no symptoms to very severe symptoms. Um, we've, we've read reports about that. Yeah. Would you especially like to see? Yeah, uh, especially yeah. among those who have underlying conditions. Because it's very rare that you get a kid, unlike an adult. No? Adults, talagang, it's, rare, it's very rare that you see a child with an underlying condition. Unless mm -hmm. they already have a congenital problem, like congenital heart disease, congenital lung disease, yung mga may systemic lupus, etc., etc. But when you look at adults, mas maraming comorbids ang adults eh. Diabetes, yeah. hypertension, so on and so forth. True, true, sir. Moving on to our next question, I think you partly answered this already. How contagious are asymptomatic carriers? Well, that's a debate, no? Um, some say they're not, they're not contagious. Some say they are. But the mere fact that they don't have symptoms, they don't cough, they don't uh, have sore throat, they don't have fever, they don't have a way of transmitting. Because respiratory droplets, to, eh. diba? On the other hand, it's possible that the asymptomatic is a smoker. Diba? That's why I'm telling you this is the best time to quit. It's possible that you have an asymptomatic who is a smoker, or you have an asymptomatic, yung mga laway niya, kung saan saan nila lagay, o asymptomatic siya, pero singer siya. Kaya nga, that's my pet peeve. Eh. Yung, yeah. yung naglalagay lang sila ng, ng, ng face shield, pero kumakanta ka, nandun sa loob yung microphone. No? Because singing and talking for a prolonged period of time is the best way to circulate all those droplets in the air. So, kung PP naman yung asymptomatic at wala naman siyang masyadong kwan, maganda yun. Eh, hindi eh. 
So that's aging debate. As long as yeah. there there are droplets that are being scattered, uh, then they are contagious. Otherwise, they are not. Yes, it's really a matter of droplets and aerosol. True. Sir, moving on to the next question. Can COVID-19 or probably SARS-CoV-2 is what they mean, transferable? Is it transferable from man to animal and vice versa? I have a friend who turned out to be asymptomatic and is now isolated who owned a dog and we adopted the pet during his confinement. So I think this is a very specific, very, very personal question. Well, um, it's possible. It's just that I don't think uh, the dogs are, you know, most of the studies show it's cats eh, rather than dogs. Cats? So, cats, feline, oh, civets. Wow. Diba? Yung transmissibility niya. Mas kwan sa civet. Kaya di ba sa Wuhan? When they found out that it is transmissible, they started throwing all of the dogs and the cats outside of their condos for them to die from the 45th mm -hmm. floor, 35th floor. That's how they killed their pets. Eh? Oh my goodness. So I don't really okay. know if it's going to get transmitted. I don't think so. Unless yung owner, eh, nakikipaghali ka doon sa dog na ng lips to lips. <laughs> and some of them do. Yes, my mom, for example, is one. She wants the dog to, <laughs> yes. to kiss her in the mouth. I can tell her, Ma, stop that. <laughs> Wala. Silver, kiss me, yeah. kiss mommy. She always goes, yuck. <laughs> I do love dogs, but yes, yeah, no, no kisses for me. Yeah, imagine right. he licks his pee pee and then he, he will kiss you. <laughs> oh, oh. Yeah. I true, sir, walking, true. I will not kiss him in the mouth. Okay, everybody, remember that. Don't kiss your dogs in the mouth. All right. For our next question, sir, in your opinion, yes. is lifting the GCQ a good idea, knowing we don't have good data to plan? And if it is lifted, what precautions or preparations should the government take? Paulit-ulit na nga ako dyan sa recommendation na hindi naman na... Baka naman meron isa sa inyo na malakas kay President Duterte. Kasi kung meron isa sa inyo na malakas kay President Duterte, pakisabi sa kanya, the real... The right way to do it is... The right way to lift a, a quarantine is to capacitate every local government. Which means that every local government must have one isolation facility its own isolation facility, and two, must have a dedicated testing center. So that hindi mm -hmm. you na know, overwhelm ang gobyerno. You, di ba? Imagine if you have, pabida ka eh, sabihin mo, oh, we have 60 plus testing capacity, testing centers in the country. Yeah, but they're all crowded in the in Metro Manila. They're all crowded in one. They're all crowded. Mm -hmm. What yeah. the, what the? Di ba? Dapat mag, pag nagtayo ka, isa lang sa Makati, o oh, dalawa kayo sa Makati, o oh, hindi, hindi lahat nag apply sa Makati. Hindi lahat nag apply sa Muntinlupa. Oh, dapat yung bawat LGU, meron sarili at meron siyang isolation. Kasi pag naspot mo na yung tao mo doon, doon, ilalagay mo lang doon sa isolation unit. Tapos pag hinahanap ka naman, balik na naman doon. But I, I understand the local governments. I think it's more on finance. You know, they're, they're going to say, where are we going to get the money? But it ends up as a white elephant. The white elephant I talk about is that you have isolation facilities. You, you, you saw my slides. Look at how many beds there are, 52,000. How many cases do we have that are active? 20 plus lang. Why don't you just put them in the isolation facilities? Because... You will need manpower. You will need money. You will need people to guard them. You will need three people. You will need three people for every facility, every small facility, because they will take shifts. Because you will need to feed them. Because you will need to pay the electricity. You will need water. You will need food. And sa gobyerno, Sa local government, I'm not talking about the national government. Sa local government, kung mas marunong lang siya, ang problema sa local government, ayuda-ayuda. 
Okay? Yeah. And the people like the ayuda, the ayuda, ayuda that they get, the 8,000, 8,000, but that money is going to disappear. Which means that after quite some time, there's no money to give anymore. And there's no business to go back to. Yes. That's very true, sir. And, but may I say, over here in Pasig City, our good mayor, Mayor Vico, has a very good quarantine facility. And he has food brought to the quarantine people. And he even has, I think, a, a, dra uh, a movie night for them with snacks. I've seen it. So I guess if our LGUs are just a little more efficient and effective this will help with our overall response yes yeah but uh, kanya -kanya eh. you see the metro manila is tikit tikit yung boundary niya yung ihian lang ng kapit bahay mo boundary na eh. dito lang sa bf oh di ba oh, isang street yan las piñas na yung kabilang street muntin lupa yung isang street para nyake so if you have a house that is in between them, you don't know whether you are crossing Muntinlupa, Las Piñas, or Paranaque. So every local government has its, its kingdom. Nga eh. I think they watch too many Korean novela. Kingdom! Kingdom! Yes, sir. Moving on to, yes, really, they should. Moving on to the next question, sir, we do have a, a few more before we would try, we try to... Um, Put in all of our questions as much as possible. If hormones play a role in the immune response, does that mean menopausal women and people with hormonal problems are more vulnerable to this infection? Uh, we don't know that for now. Uh, we've not we've not actually dived deep into it, but uh, that's a possibility. Mm, okay. So. Yeah, we should be on the lookout for that. Theoretically, yes. No? But, uh, mm -hmm. if you look at the data, the women survive, the men die. So, yeah. talagang, the weaker sex are the males. <laughs> oh, no, I'm not okay. kidding. If you, look at the, yeah. the, if you look at the risk factors, the risk factors for death, male, that's one. Male. And second yeah. is if you have underlying health condition. The third one is your age. So, etong tatlong to, and then the fourth one is obesity. So, if you put, if you have all of these four factors together, you are the perfect candidate to be six oh, feet yeah. under. Okay. Yeah. Once you yeah. come down with it, yeah. Uh, Diba? That's why they encourage you exercise, you lose weight, etc., etc., get more sun. Yeah, that's the idea. Yes. All right. Next question, sir. Could you explain how the flu and pneumonia vaccinations may be good measures to undertake at this time of pandemic? Well, um, I've always recommended that if you can have one, if you have a preventable disease, a pulmonary preventable disease better. I say we, we know that uh, COVID is a lung problem. So you don't want by the time you come down with it, uh, you can get, it's possible for you to come down with a secondary bacterial infection. So the pneumococcal vaccine will prevent a secondary. The streptococcus pneumonia is actually the most common um, bacterial pneumonia. Uh, in the community. So there is a vaccine that will prevent that. The other one is flu because we are towards the flu season. The flu season is the rainy season. So the rainy season in the Philippines brings about a lot of cases for flu. So if we get protected with two, at least you, if you come down with COVID, you will not get the complications of either the flu or streptococcus pneumonia, pneumonia. Mm -hmm. All right. Very good to know. Next question, sir. Is the viral load in aerosols less than the load in droplets? Um, the ones in aerosols actually are generated. That's why aerosol generating procedures. Right? Yes. So, nagiging problema sa aerosol is it pushes the 
the virus to spread. Na, na, naintindihan nyo? So, napopropagate, lalo na kung medyo um, very poor ang exhaust system ninyo sa loob ng clinics. Eh, ang dami nyo, ka, lahat pa naman kayo, mo, most of the dentists, if not all of the dentists, uh, utilize an aerosol generating procedure. Mm-hmm. Diba? Yes, sir. Actually, in our uh, PDA guidelines, we are actually encouraging all dentists to try to avoid the AGPs, the aerosol generating yeah. procedure, and to do non AGPs at this time, for this time, um, and try to do urgent and emergency cases only. Yeah. As a follow up to that, sir, part of the. Wala oh, no. pasta, bonot na lang. <laughs> oh no, sir, wait. No, but sir, um, as a as a quick follow up to that, part of the recommendations, not it's not mandatory, but part of the recommendations is to have or to request an RT PCR test for patients who will be undergoing AGPs in the dental yeah. clinic. How do you feel about that? Is that feasible? And, you know, how long before the procedure and after the test results come out do we it, accept the test results? It's it's your call, no? I, 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 what I'm telling you is that um, even, especially if the patients don't have symptoms, um, they may get a false negative PCR. Mm-hmm. You get my point? I said the viral yeah. load may be very low. And then mm-hmm. during the procedure, don't ninyo ipropropagate. So mm-hmm. it might give you a false sense of, it's not like doing surgery, for example. Not, not, and I talk about general surgery. You have to do an appendectomy. I'm oh, sorry, not an appendectomy. An elective surgery, let's say, uh, or elec- an elective procedure. Let's let let's say colonoscopy. You will not mm-hmm. need to do anything, naman in a colonoscopy except give the patient uh, a general anesthetic, diba? And then do mm-hmm. the, the colonoscopy. So, wala na siyang... in, in, in these types of patients, uh, even though mag false negative siya sa PCR wala kang risk ang problema okay. pag aerosol generating procedure kahit na mag negative siya sa PCR remember the PCR is only 67% accurate mm-hmm. eh, 33 okay yeah there are a lot diba? of uh, varying yeah uh, so may sir, risk pa din. May- Yes, there's always a risk. Uh, next question, sir. If the novel coronavirus antibodies do not offer long-term immunity, how would a vaccine help? Mm, that's the same thing that we do with flu vaccine. The vaccine will help. It will provide herd immunity until nobody else gets the coronavirus infection. You want at least 80% of the population, depending on how effective the vaccine is. The vaccine is very effective in at least get 60 to 70 to 80% of the community to get immunized so that nobody else will get infected. Mm-hmm. So the vaccine will be helpful that way. Now, the problem is um, in mutations, in platform, and in immunologic response. That, 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 that's the point I was trying to drive at a while ago, which means that if you're using one platform, for example, yung adenovirus or yung nucleotide, your mRNA platform, hindi mo sila pwedeng ipag-switch. Hindi this year I'm going to use the adenovirus, next year I'm going to use the mRNA, o hindi available yung kwan, hindi mo pwede, hindi sila switchable eh. Na, na hmm, true. No? Yes. Hindi pwedeng Kasi iba-ibang platform ang pasok nila. So pag iba-ibang platform, they're not interchangeable. So if you need a vaccine that will require four, va- four shots for the year, example lang, example, may lumabas. You need four shots, zero, one, six, and twelve, so that you get at least 80% uh, efficacy. You need the four shots. Then 
The next, kung hindi available yon, yung adenovirus platform na binigay mo at available yung mRNA, balik ka na naman doon sa four shots o three shots kung depende kung ano yung, yung platform na ginamitan. Unlike if you take it from the same platform, always, baka ang mangyari niyan, you get the four, the next year, annual na lang. Parang yung flu vaccine. You see the flu vaccine? In children less than eight years old who have never been immunized, the recommendation is to give two shots. You cannot give only one. So it's the same concept. But with the flu vaccine, it is alive, attenuated. Yes. The yes, light kill yes. vaccine. Yeah. True, sir. I actually sometimes get uh, sick after I get the flu vaccine. Mm. <laughs> um, next question, sir. Is fecal root of infection true? Is it possible? Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's one of the more common um, routes, actually. Uh, so sorry, that's one of the more common presentations, not not routes. One of the more common presentations, um, because it is a virus. So many of the viruses will present with diarrhea. Mm. For example, measles. Measles presents with diarrhea. Dengue. I get patients who have dengue who will present with diarrhea. Mm. Like many viral infections, they will present with diarrhea. And this is one mm. of those that will. Hello? Yeah. Ah, okay, sorry, sir. I thought I lost you there for a minute. Okay, next question. Running can post... Uh, sorry, running can be difficult when wearing a mask together with the carbon dioxide buildup in the body. Oh, the question is, is it safe to run without a mask despite the government requiring everyone to wear masks in public? Uh, you go to a place where there are no people, you run there. Yeah, um, true. The mask is supposed to protect both you and to protect the other person. It's not about you. It's about it's about uh, protecting both you and the other person. Because you, for all you know, you might have, you're just asymptomatic. Diba? True. So if you need to run, you don't need to wear an N95 you will die if you wear an N95 and then run. What I suggest is you, you can wear a cloth mask. The cloth mask will not kill you because it is wearable and it is breathable. As a matter of fact, if you look at all the K-novelas, all of the people wear masks and then they're running, wearing a mask. They're working out, exercising, wearing a mask. So yes, wear a mask, but use a cloth mask. I think Uniqlo is going to come out with a breathable face mask. You can use that. You're supposed to be running. You're not supposed to be communicating with other people. Diba? So just wear a breathable face mask. Exactly. And maybe, you know... Run at home. If you can. Naman. Run at home. <laughs> so Without a mask as much as home. you want. <laughs> well, you know, we do what we can. We had our, uh, well, in our village, for example, we couldn't even jog outside. So we yes. had to make do. You know, you make do now in the time of COVID. Um, next question, sir. Why is azithromycin used as part of? the treatment regimen for COVID-19 when it is an antibacterial? Um, I think the reason for the azithromycin is because uh, it works on the messenger ribonucleic acid uh, for all of the macrolides, actually, as a general rule. As a matter of fact, hindi namin alam kung si azithromycin lang ang may property non. But uh, the the backbone there um, rests actually on uh, the mechanism of action of macrolides. Okay. Okay. You want me to explain the yeah. whole mechanism of action? <laughs> Of the <laughs> no, actually for me, it's I'm I'm totally you know 
fine with what the doctors will of course say is the best course of treatment and i think for all of us also who are in the dental field our our concern is really just to have a bit of an understanding but not too much <laughs> well because azithromycin is a once a day uh, if you look at all the macrolides once a day lang ang pagbigay sa kanya it's, a, it's an od no tapos it has a very large yeah. volume of distribution so um, because it has a very high volume of distribution ang nangyayari niyan it is found in tissues in very large amounts that's why it's a good drug uh, for patients with pulmonary problems now may, as a general rule macrolides actually are protein synthesis inhibitors. So its mechanism of action is it inhibits um, protein biosynthesis and they do this by adding the growing peptide attached to transfer, transferase RNA. So we call it tRNA you know, to the next amino mm -hmm. acid. And therefore it inhibits ribosomal translation. So they see some potential there and that's the reason why they add the azithromycin. And then there is an important message here that says that the event maximum duration is two yes. hours. <laughs> I'm Thank you, sir. Ako, yes, yeah. so, I was just actually yeah. I was just about to say that that will that will have to be our last question for you today. I think we were able to go through all the really good questions and we were able to glean a lot of information from you, sir. Thank you so much. You're your answers to the questions, your entire lecture was very enlightening. And we have a lot of takeaway of the most important things that we need to remember. Um, at this point, we would like to close the open forum. And we would like to present you virtually with our certificate of appreciation. If we could oh. have that on the screen. Yes, sir, because we will not be able to uh, give it to you, of course, in person. We will be um, giving it to you virtually, and we will be sending a soft copy <laughs> to you, to your email. So let me just Thank read you. it while um, it's going to be flashed on the screen in a little bit. This Certificate of Appreciation is presented by the Philippine Pediatric Dental Society, Incorporated, to Dr. Benjamin Ko in grateful recognition of his participation as guest lecturer and for sharing his expertise and knowledge through the topic, Numbers and Matters That Matter, What You Need to Know As We Adapt to the New Normal. Given this 26th day of June 2020 during the PPDSI String of Pearls webinar series, signed Dr. Rowena Castro, Awards Committee Chair, Dr. Paul Abaya, President of PPDSI, and Dr. Hazel Marie Sunico, Scientific Committee Chair. Once again, Dr. Benjamin Ko, thank you so much for imparting your knowledge and sharing your time with us today. We are very grateful and honored to have you with us today. Okay, thank you. All right, goodbye. Enjoy your weekend. Bye -bye. Thank you very much, sir. Once again, on behalf of all of the officers and board members of the Philippine Pediatric Dental Society, we thank you for joining us today and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye and good afternoon.